Amen. Amen. All right. Tonight, of course, we're going to be concluding our Bible study going through the book of Lamentations. There are five chapters, and tonight we're going to be preaching through chapter number five. Again, there are 22 verses in chapter number 5. So I want to hit on something real quick, just as an introduction. It's going to be somewhat of a reminder. Uh, uh, I've mentioned it a few other times, but then I'm also going to elaborate a little bit more on some information as well. So if you go back to Lamentations chapter number 1, as you probably already recall, I pointed out that there are 22 verses in Lamentations chapter number 5. If you go to chapter number 2, we're going to notice also that there are 22 verses. Chapter number 3 has 66 verses. Chapter number 4 has 22 verses. And chapter number 5 has 22 verses. So there are four chapters in the book of Lamentation, then, Lamentations excuse me, that have 22 verses. Then we have Lamentations chapter number 3 which has 66 verses. Now I began to talk about this for a few minutes, but I kind of got off of it in Lamentations chapter number 1 and Lamentations chapter number 2 because it wasn't necessarily as relevant. The, one of the reasons why there are 22 verses is because those verses actually represent what was pinned down in Hebrew and is originally written down. Uh, the, the Hebrew version of what you are looking at here, if you go to Lamentations chapter number 1, Two, four, and five. What you actually see is acrostic. I'm sorry, actually one, two, and four. Uh, what you actually see is acrostic uh, 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 poetry. And when you go to Lamentations 1, just to use that as an example, in the, uh, uh, the, the text when it was originally written down, the book of Lamentations in the Hebrew, what you have is a verse that is given to an, uh, each letter of the alphabet. So, as we see in verse number one, no, how doth the city sit solitary? When this was originally written down, this actually is, it begins with uh, the letter Aleph, right? Which is just like our letter A. It's rooted in that. If you look at verse number two, and obviously we can see this in the English as well, when it begins with, How doth the city sit solitary? How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion? There, verse number one with chapter number two. So what you have here also, it begins with Aleph. Now there are 22 uh, letters in the Hebrew alphabet. That's why there are 22 verses. Because when they, when they assigned verses to each of these, what they did was they assigned it to that one statement where you find that each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it is designed, or I'm sorry, it is uh, delineated that way. Even in the English Bible, we can see that. When you get to chapter number three, what goes on here is <coughs> in each of the verses, there are actually three uh, uh, times where each letter is repeated. Well, and so in verse, well, I'm sorry, in verse one, two, and three, what you have is each of those begin with Aleph. And then verse 4, 5, and 6, each of those begin with beta, which is the second letter, right, of, their, of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's just, it's just tripled then. So that's why we have 66 verses. So there is a, a acrostic poetry going on with the Hebrew. We can also see that even in the English Bible as well in that sense. So when we get to Lamentations chapter number 5, we have 22 verses, and there are 22 statements when, you know, it was penned down in Hebrew. But the difference is, in Lamentations chapter number 5, no longer does it keep the consistency of where we are going through a, uh, a statement that begins with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Basically, that falls apart. I've read a lot of people that have talked about this. I've read some commentaries about this. And I had heard about this, you know, preached by somebody quite a while ago. And everybody's interpretation, which seems to make perfect sense with me for a couple of reasons, is that it's because everything's just falling apart. It's almost like, uh, like the, the, the person has given up. That's the way that everybody describes this. Every person that I've, I've listened to explain this. Everybody describes it the same way. And I'll tell you why they describe it that way is because I believe verse number 22. If I had to you know, give a, a subtitle to chapter number 5, what I would title it as is hopelessness. I would title the end of the book of Lamentations as hopelessness. Look at verse number 22. He says this, But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. That is the end of the book of Lamentations. So does that, does that you know, uh, uh, leave you with kind of an optimistic type of ending or attitude? Not even slightly. It's a very you know, uh, uh, depressing, 
you know, hopeless type of conclusion there. And I believe that is the why that we see in here in chapter number five, once we you know transition into the very last chapter of the book of Lamentations, why we see this, this major change that takes place where he's no longer using that same type of acrostic poetry, that same type of order that he was, is because the, the, the city of Jerusalem is in great disorder. So he tries to kind of keep himself together there. And obviously this is meant to, to just convey this message. He tries to keep himself together there through you know, the first four chapters. But then once he gets to that fifth chapter, it just falls apart. There's no longer the consistency. There's no longer the order of you know, the acrostic you know, uh, 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 poetry that was being used with each letter of the Hebrew uh, um, you know, uh, alphabet. It just falls apart. And that is actually what's going on in chapter number 5. And it's just basically going to continue the same theme. Uh, the theme of the book of Lamentations <coughs> is very concentrated throughout the entire book of Lamentations. That's another thing you can take away from this Bible study. You know, you can go to the book of Romans and study the book of Romans. And you're going to learn about various topics. You know, there's going to be an overall theme. Uh, but he's going to branch out a lot more in his writing. Uh, here in the book of Lamentations, it's very concentrated on what the title of the book is, and that is lamenting on problems and sorrows. But if I had to give a subtitle to chapter number five, it is hopelessness. That is what I would subtitle the chapter, summarize the chapter with. Now let's begin in verse number one. Lamentation chapter number five, verse number one says this, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our repro reproach. Let's go ahead and compare Scripture with Scripture. I want you to go to the book of Nehemiah. So keep your hand there, of course, but go back to the book of Nehemiah. Every time I read this, I actually made this mistake uh, when I began to start reading there in the, the time of the reading of the text. If you look at, there's a, there's a pattern in Lam uh, Nehemiah chapter number 13. And if you look at verse number 14, you'll see this. I don't think he does it prior to that. No, the first time is in verse number 14. Look at Nehemiah chapter number 13, verse number 14. He says this, <coughs> Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. Then look at verse number 22 and uh, uh, it looks like there's two sentences, two clauses there beginning with the second sentence in verse number 22 uh, towards the end about three quarters of the way through it says this, remember me O oh my God concerning this also and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. And then uh, we have one more time there in verse number, actually there's two more times, verse number 29 it says remember them O oh my God because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. And that was an imprecatory prayer there. And then look at verse number 31. Look how he concludes uh, the book of Nehemiah. It says, And for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God. And then he says, For good. When I began reading Lamentations chapter number 5, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but I said, remember me, O Lord. And then I kind of backtracked and then started again. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach is what Lamentations 5.1 says. So we can see here, this is, a, this is a perfect example of a prayer when, someone's, when someone is entreating the Lord, when they're asking the Lord. And what does he mean by remember? Obviously, God doesn't have to call things to remembrance. It's not like God can possibly forget things. That's not possible. So what he's saying is to behold. That's why he says, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. And then he says this, consider. He's saying, look. Look at this and think about it. Right? Take note of it. And then he says, and behold our reproach. He wants God to look at him and think about him. He wants God to look at him and visit him. And he wants the Lord to show him mercy in his lowly estate and everything that's going on right now with the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at verse number 2. It says this. He goes on to describe the destruction as he, as he did in uh, the other previous chapters. He says, our inheritance is turned to strangers our houses to aliens. Now when he says strangers and aliens there, he's talking about foreigners. Of course, Babylon invaded Jerusalem. And what they did when they, when they came in, they just took what they like. Just like when Israel would go in, you know, they would take of the booty or of the spoils thereof. That's what ba Babylon did. When Babylon came in, they just basically took control. They just came in and killed who they wanted to kill. They took captive who they wanted to take captive. Those that were 
intelligent or wise who would benefit the kingdom, they were taken back. They were still captive, but they were used, you know, as a resource for the kingdom of Babylon. And then whatever else people wanted to help themselves to, they just did so. So if somebody liked a house, they would just go in and take a house. If somebody, you know, liked, uh, you know, uh, any portion of land, they would just go and they would just possess that land themselves. They would just take over that land. Basically, they're just coming in and bullying people. They're coming in and just stealing whatever they want. That's what happened. You got to kind of put yourselves in their shoes and, and understand exactly what went on and how horrible this actually was when an invading, you know, an army comes in and they just help themselves to anything that they would like. Can you imagine just having property, you know, having land and somebody just coming and just stealing your land and living on your land and, and, and taking over at your house and, and living in your house. Look at what it says next. Verse number three. We are orphans and fatherless. Our mothers are as widows. So he, he's talking about just them in general. There's so many of them that are children where their parents have died. So now what are they? They're, they're orphans or they're fatherless, right? He says we are orphans and fatherless and he says our mothers are as widows. So, of course, also many children died. So there's many mothers that are in Jerusalem that their children have died. And, and a widow, obviously, would be referring to their, her, their husbands uh, being dead. And oftentimes they would come in and kill the man because he would be a threat to them. Look at number uh, four there. Verse number four, it says, We have drunken our water for money, our wood is sold unto us. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. So it's talking about them being in captivity there. And he talks about how they are drinking their water for money. So what they're having to do is they, they're, they're being forced to labor, right? They're, with their own water, they're having to go gather their own water. And then after they work and get the water, they do all the labor to get the water, they end up having to pay their slave master, if you will, in order to drink it. So they go out and they gather the water. They go out to the river or wherever they have to and they get the bucket and they bestow all the labor that is necessary in order to transport that water back to civilization. But once they get it back there, they give it to the slave master. They, they give it to him and then maybe that guy pays them for the little bit of work that they did and then they give that money straight back, which was the labor that they, in the first place, you know, uh, uh, how they earned that money. Then they give that money straight back to them and then they're able to partake of the water. Uh, and of course, do you think they're being paid a good wage? Not a chance. <coughs> they are uh, uh, you know, uh, in captivity. It says, our wood is sold unto us. So they're laboring for the wood. They're going out and cutting down the tree. And then that same wood that they labored for is now they're, gonna, they're having to purchase it and pay for it. It says in verse 5, this is referring to the fact that they're under uh, slavery, they're in slavery. Our necks are under persecution. Uh, now, when it says necks, it's talking about them being in a yoke. It's talking about them wearing a yoke. And when you're, when you're in a yoke, that's, that's referring to the fact that you are being oppressed, right? That you are you know, uh, in captivity, of, as I've said, or you are uh, in slavery even. It says, we labor and have no rest. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. So they've made a deal with. When it's talking about giving the hand to them, it's talking about making a deal with them. Our fathers have sinned and are not. That means they're dead. And we have borne their iniquities. Servants have ruled over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. Now it's perfectly applicable in verse number 7 that he says, Our fathers have sinned and are not and we have borne their iniquities. Notice he uses the word borne. That means carried. Because they are literally carrying their, carrying their sins. Why is that? Because they are carrying them in the labor that they're doing. The labor is basically the sins. They're carrying around the sins because it is a physical manifestation because it's the direct punishment of the sins that their fathers had committed. And then they pass that down, of course, to their children. Verse number 8 says, Servants have ruled over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. So this is obviously meant to speak about, you know, of the demeaning state that the Jews are in at this time because it says, 
servants have ruled over us. So it's not even just kings ruling over them. I mean, they're so far at the bottom of the food chain that servants are ruling over them for crying out loud. So it's trying to express their, their extreme oppression in the state that they're in and how they are just at the bottom, as I said, of the barrel or the food chain. It says, there is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. And that ties back with the woman. If you remember in Lamentations 1, it was basically the whole thing was just an allegory of you know, the woman Zion. And she was just crying out to God repeatedly and falling in the streets and people are walking by her and no one's listening to her and she's crying out repeatedly for someone to comfort her and for someone to come deliver her. And over and over again she says that her comforter has abandoned her, her comforter has left her, her deliverer has forsaken her. Notice that statement again, we see it again. It says, there is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. She says over and over again, there's none that doth comfort me. Or, and there's no one to comfort me. Look at verse 9. We got, or like got, right? We got our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Now peril means danger. So they're saying like their lives were in danger <coughs> when they went to get bread. And it says because of the sword of the wilderness. Verse 10. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Now, Flip back over to Lamentations chapter number 4. I touched on this a little bit last week, so I'm not going to go into it in great detail. But if you go over to Lamentations chapter number 4, this was referenced again um, just in the previous chapter. <laughs> it says in verse 7, Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It is become like a stick. Then verse 9. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be uh, slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through for one of the fruits of the field. So notice what we see described here in verses 7 through 9 is the same thing. It's famine. It's, it's, it's describing people that are famished, that, that are, you know, they are uh, starving is what's going on. It begins on describing the Nazarites, giving us a, a description of the Nazarites, and it tells us they are purer than snow, they are whiter than milk. And just to prove, and I went over this last week, that this is describing their complexion or their, the hue of their skin. That's why it says they're whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Ruddy is a way to describe someone that, when, that you can see the blood basically pumping through their bodies. Right? Ruddy, the way that that word is used nowadays is like when someone is ruddy in the face. Right? It's when they are blushing. That's when someone is ruddy. When someone's maybe playing outside and they come running inside. Or maybe if someone is working out or something like that and you've probably seen a lot of people that way. You know, they'll become very uh, uh, blushed in the face or ruddy. Ruddy comes from the word red. Uh, it, it derives from the same word. And the only person that you would be able to consider ruddy, where you can actually see the blood pumping through their bodies, or someone that can become flushed in the face, is a person that is of a white complexion. So it just shows that this is clearly speaking literally about their physical appearance, and it, because it says that they are white, they're whiter than snow. It, then it talks about them being ruddy. Then it compares it unto being polishing, of, which is of sapphire, which is also red. Not only that, Solomon is also described himself as being white. And at the same time, it's describing his hair. And it says that his hair is dark like a raven. It talks about how you know, uh, uh, his hair is bushy. And he's specifically described as being white. Um, David was also described as being ruddy. And this was talking about his physical appearance. So it's clearly speaking about his physical appearance. And then in verse 8, so that's how they were naturally. That was their natural state. Then in verse 8 it says, their visage is. Now this is present tense. So there's been a change. Blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. So they look so different that people can't even recognize them is the point. They look a lot different. Obviously it's meant to be exaggerated, but the point is that they were originally white, now they're black, and it's so different than how they originally looked naturally that they're not even known in the streets, right? It goes on and it describes why they are this way. It says, their skin cleaveth to their bones. This is talking about a person, person that is famished. Uh, 
They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. Now this is talking about just like an anorexically skinny person, right? It's talking about a person that is dangerously skinny. It's talking about a person that is in a famine. You go on to verse number 9 and it repeats the same thing. It says, uh, They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. So if we compare that idea there back to verse number 10 where we're reading, it says, Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. So in Lamentations chapter number 4, why was their skin black now? Because they were withered away. They become like a stick. Right? It says that their skin cleaveth to their bones. It's because of the famine, which is plainly what we're told in Lamentations chapter number 5. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Now, it's real interesting uh, with this. We can go to the book of Job. We can try to find it. <coughs> Maybe I can have Brother Rick look it up real quick. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, Brother Rick, <coughs> uh, you've done this before. Look in the book of Job on your phone real quick where the passages where his, his friends come to him initially and then they fall down and they're weeping and it says that they can't even, you know, they can't even recognize him. If you're able to, to, to uh, find that. I think I actually just opened straight to it here. Job chapter number uh, uh, 2, verse number 12. Let's see if I'm able to find the other passage after this. Job chapter number 2, verse number 12 says, And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward Heaven. So I want you to notice that even his friends, what does it say? They knew him not. Now, I think I, I think I know where this is, but I'm not positive. I think I have a note written in it. I do. Uh, Job chapter number 30. Go to Job chapter number 30 and look at verse number 30. Job chapter number 30, verse number 30. It says this, My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burned with heat. Now, I, I have another reference here. This is the one that I wanted to go to, actually. Go to Job chapter 19, verse 20. I want you to notice this consistency with being black, people not recognizing them, and then also being famished. Look at chapter number 19, look at verse number 20. He says, My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh. And I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. And you notice how he describes his body and what he's going through? He's famished. Why? Because he lost all of his food. So notice that it says that his bones, I'm sorry, his skin cleaveth to his bones. Doesn't that sound familiar? Familiar? It's, you know, I'm saying famished over and over again. Familiar? Doesn't it sound familiar? Yeah, it's exactly what was described in Lamentations chapter number 4 when it's talking about the Israelites. And what was the reason why they were black? It was because... Their, their skin cleaved to their bones. Now, there's this really clear, consistent teaching throughout the Bible that when someone is in a famine, that they become darkened in, in, in their skin complexion or they become blackened in their skin you know, complexion. Now, I've looked it up and, and I can't remember the explanation. I looked it up when I, back when I lived in Arizona, but there was an explanation on why this takes place. Maybe it's just a lack of nourishment or maybe it's because something of the, of the, uh, the skin <coughs> or the color when the skin is cleaving to the bones, maybe a color that's given off from the bones because it is just so, you know, so close in proximity to the bones, you can actually see the bones. I don't know exactly what it, how that works, but uh, there is a teaching in the Bible very clearly that when a person becomes famished, that when they are in a famine, that their skin cleaves to their bones. Their, 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 their skin is withered away. And when they are in a famine, when you look at them, they become black, or they look black, or their skin becomes darker. Just like we saw there in, in uh, Lamentation chapter number 4, they weren't able to recognize them. It says they, they didn't know them. They, you know, they aren't known in the streets. Why? Because they were black, or they were white, now they're black. Why? Because of a famine. What happened with Job? They weren't able to recognize him. Why? It says now that he, now he's black, and what was the reason? Because of famine. I mean, it's very clear, it's very consistent. Go back to Lamentations, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Lamentations chapter number 5. So we see it taught twice in the book of Lamentations, Lamentations 4, and then also a very, very clear statement in Lamentations 5. Then we see it even taught 
uh, with Job himself. We see the same exact type of teaching with Job uh, in the book of Job. <coughs> so it says, Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. And oftentimes these black Hebrew Israelites, they're so stinking stupid. The, the, the verses that they go to every time to try to show you <coughs> that they were black, it's every single passage. It's, it's where it's telling you that they're not normally black. But now they've become black. Every time. <clears throat> they turn you to Lamentations 5 and they'll read it like our skin was black like an oven. See? The people in the Bible, the Israelites, were black. Then they'll go to the passage in Song of Solomon and they, they understand the Bible so little that I've repeatedly heard these guys try to say that this is Solomon that's speaking. It's not Solomon that's talking. And you don't have to be a stinking Bible scholar or have a theological degree to understand that. It's very clearly his wife speaking unto him. And his wife says to him that she has, or just says in general, that she has become black and this is because the sun has looked upon her. So does that sound like she's normally black? Does it sound like she's always black or that her natural skin tone is black or does it sound like there's been a dramatic shift in you know, uh, the color of or the pigment of her skin? An extreme change in the hue of her skin. That's the same thing that we have here. It's obviously meant to stress that it's dramatic if there's this big change from white to black and then they say they're not known in the streets. What's the point? That this is so far from their original or natural you know, uh, uh, appearance that we can't even recognize them. Now, of course, it's exaggeratory. Yes, of course it's exaggeratory. Yes. That's the point, <laughs> especially in this context. He's trying to stress and emphasize to you the extreme destruction and sorrow that they are going through and persecution. Uh, but even still, what we can learn from this is that on a scale from white to black, they were closer to white than they were to black. That's the point. And when they became darker or when they became famished or when they go out into the sun, now all of a sudden they're you know black. It, considered black, right? You know, if you were to try to uh, pinpoint a, a type of people that fall into this category as their skin tone, that can have a dramatic change in their skin tone, it would be people that live in that area. I mean, you know, does it seem that hard? Ding, 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 ding. Maybe look at Turkish people. Maybe look at Syrian people. Maybe look at people that are from Lebanon and that, those types of areas. When they're not in the sun, they're pretty pale. They really are. If you see the people that like live inside, some of the politicians especially, they're pretty pale looking. But if you go watch you know, some of the uh, uh, videos maybe of, of the people that are like wanderers and things like that that live out, and they're still of the same ethnical group, they're still of the same nation, but these people like live out in the desert, you know, uh, uh, people that are maybe like shepherds, like they're very dark, extremely dark. Those same people have this super wide spectrum of how they're able to, you know, uh, 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 you know tan and they can become very, very dark. But naturally they kind of have, you know, a lighter skin tone. And if they, we were to say, hey, this person's white and this person's black, right? Because no one's really white or really black. You know, I'm not white, right? People would say, hey, you're a white man. This is white, right? That's white. Right, I'm, my technical skin tone or skin color is not white, nor are people really black. So if we want to be really, really strict, you know, you know, African Americans are not black either. No one's white or no one's black. But if we have this spectrum of, you know, the color of one's skin, they fall closer to what we would consider as white, just like I do. Now, are they, are they darker than me? Maybe further this way? Yeah, I'm sure that they were. But they're still not so far to be considered black. That's the point. Now, an African American, would you, would you consider the, the skin tone of your average African American white ever? Of course not. They would be considered black, right? You would say, hey, that person's black. Right? If, you were to, if you have a spectrum and you only have two options, right? you would say, yeah, they're probably, you know, they would be black. They would not be white. So it just shows that if we are to peg or to, to say, hey, you know, white or black or where do they fit in? Well, the Bible refers to them as white. The Bible says that. But here's the thing. Let me end with this. This is the most important point that people don't get. I'm standing up for this particular doctrine because it's in the Bible. It has nothing to do with my skin tone. If I was black, I'd be preaching the same exact thing because the Bible is still the same thing. Because it's not subjective to my own opinion. And it doesn't matter in the first place uh, whether or not they were white or black. That's the point that I'm getting across. You know, number one, we need to love the truth. And it doesn't matter whether or not 
when you preach something, you, you know, people are going to kind of misconstrue it or try to say it like, hey, you're only saying that because you're this. Like, if I preach on, you know, something about pastors being paid, what are people going to say? You just want to be paid. You preach on tithing, what are people going to say? I mean, every single time, what do they say? Oh, it's just because you're a pastor of the church. It's like, who else is going to preach it, moron? It's like, yeah, I'm standing up and preaching it because it's in the stinking Bible. Well, it's the same thing that goes on here. I'm standing up and preaching, right, this truth because it's in the Bible. It has nothing to do with who I am, what position I'm in, what nation I came from. It's what it teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. So, the Bible does talk about it, so I'm not going to ignore it. But is it significant when it comes to favor in the eyes of God? It, should it be significant when it comes to favor in the eyes of man? Of course not. The Bible says that, speaking of God, it says he hath made all nations of one blood. We're all the same anyways. We're all of one blood. Whether or not one, some people are lighter skinned or darker skinned or some people have brown eyes or blue eyes or some people are tall or short, it doesn't matter at all. Let me tell you what really does matter. Whether you are in Christ Jesus, that's what matters. You know, what matters is whether or not you're saved and whether or not Jesus Christ or God is your Father. And that is what gives you favor, whether or not you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what truly and really matters. That's what should matter to us. Look here in Lamentations chapter number 5. <coughs> And we'll begin again in verse number 11. The Bible says this, They ravished the women in Zion <coughs> and the maids in the cities of Judah. And ravished is referring to raping the women. That's what that means. Of course, this is... This, chapter number 5 really just becomes more explicit and it becomes a lot more negative because he's building up to verse number 22, which we already read of just pure and complete hopelessness. It's saying that they're coming in and they're stealing their houses. Notice how it's taking it a step further. It's just talking about how they're just so demeaning unto them. The servants are ruling over them. They're coming in and taking their property. They're taking their homes. They're taking their possessions and their inheritance. They're coming in and they are forcing them to labor and then making them buy with the little bit of money that they give, making them buy that which they labored for. They have to buy it back, their own wood and their own water. Notice how demeaning chapter number 5 is and how much more negative it became. Now it's talking about how poorly they're being treated, that the, 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 these soldiers is coming in, and this happens in war a lot. I've heard a lot of stories about it happening even in Iraq. I've heard a lot of stories of it happening in Vietnam and all different types of things. When an army goes in, you know, a lot of times the soldiers, you know, they can be wicked people. They're just people in general, and they'll come in and they'll just do whatever they want. And sometimes some people are perverts. You know what they'll do is they'll rape the women. That's what the Babylonians, the soldiers, did to the women of Judah, or the women of Jerusalem. They came in and they, they ravished the women. That's what that means. In Zion, and the maids, that's referring to a virgin, and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hand. The faces, the faces of elders were not honored. So it's talking about those that should be honored, they're not receiving honor. The princes, they're not receiving honor, they're being hanged up by their hands, right? And the faces of elders were not honored. They took the young men to grind, and the children fell under the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, <coughs> the young men from their music. So all the goodness and all the blessings have ceased, that's what that means. You see there the elders, you know, uh, they've ceased from the gate. That was an honor. The men that stood at the gate, the men that sat at the gate, they were honored. These were men that had labored their lives, they had worked, they were wise men that had wisdom, they were able to no longer you know, have to labor, and they would go and they would sit at the gate, saying that that doesn't happen anymore. It's kind of, when I read this passage, I parallel this or I liken this to like the, the men that like go and sit at the barber shop. <clears throat> I'm sure you've you know, seen that before, you know, the, where I grew up, uh, directly where I actually grew up is Alexandria, Kentucky, which is a little bit rural. And there's a barber shop there that's connected to a, a, a restaurant. It's really known for breakfast called Spare Time. There's a guy, Roger, who cut my hair almost my whole life. And there's a group of these same old men, hoary-headed men, who go in there, they just sit in there constantly. And they just talk. And, you know, of course they talk about Kentucky basketball because that's what everybody talks about, especially older men. And they just sit there just constantly all day. And they just, they just talk. Like, these men aren't coming to just get their haircuts. 
They just come, and this is kind of the equivalency of, you know, the elders going and sitting at the gate. They sit there and they just discuss different things, discuss things going on on the farm or things going on in their house or whatever it may be, and they just talk back and forth and make fun of each other and tell jokes. So this is like the elders sitting at the gate. So we kind of have something or things that are similar to this then as well. And of course these men are respected. Even when men walk into the barber shop when I was there, you know, people would respect them, especially the younger men. Uh, the joy of our heart, verse 15, the joy of our heart is ceased. <clears throat> our dance is turned into mourning. That's why the, the young men from their music talking about it ceasing. The young men have ceased from their music. That's what that's referencing. Music represents happiness. Music is normally played at happy events. It makes us happy. It, it, uh, it, it, it arouses emotion, right? And uh, normally emotions that are good. Uh, and, and so what it's saying is all the happiness is gone. Our dance is turned into mourning. Verse 16, the crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. Now this is powerful right here. We have these three or four verses that are speaking about honor and they're speaking about joy. They're speaking about blessings, joy, and honor all in one. Obviously we see the joy of our heart is mentioned. Uh, we see the, the, the gates, uh, the, the elders ceasing from the gates. Uh, just prior to that it's talking about how the elders aren't being honored. The faces of the elders aren't being honored. It's all kind of tied in with one another. And then it goes on to talk about... <clears throat> Our dance is turned into mourning. Now, what's the purpose of dance? It's joy. People normally dance when they're happy. People don't dance and they're depressed and sad, right? They're not like dancing and then they have a sad face. They're happy. They're joyful. And then he goes on in verse number 16 and it explains, it says, The crown is fallen from our head. Now, what does a crown represent? A crown represents honor. That's what a crown represents. A crown represents glory, doesn't it? Now, Jerusalem was a glorious city, wasn't it? It was the city of God, right? It was, you know, it's referred to as the city of David, but it was the city of the Lord. Zion was it, actually what the word Zion means. You'll see it coupled with this repeatedly, even in the book of Lamentations that happens, is beautiful. That's what the word Zion means. So right here we see it talking about glory, the glory of the crown or the honor. It says, the crown is fallen from our head. So the crown has ceased. The glory has ceased. You know what else the crown represents is power. That is also what a crown represents. I want you to think about that. What took place with uh, 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 Jerusalem? It's the same exact thing. Jerusalem was previously a very powerful city. It was an extremely powerful city. Uh, at the time of Solomon, they reigned over all the other nations. If you remember in the book of, uh, at the time of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, the, the king was actually informed that, hey, you need to be careful because there, were a, there was a time when they reigned over tons of cities, even beyond the river, and, and kings and kingdoms paid tribute unto them. So notice there was a time, of course this was uh, at, at its peak, when Solomon was reigning, where Jerusalem was very powerful. They were powerful. They received honor and glory from all of the other nations around them. And notice what it says. The crown is fallen from our head. And then it says this. This is the result of that. Woe unto us that we have sinned. So notice that. What is, what is the, uh, the cause of losing glory of losing honor, of losing power. What is it? Sin. This summarizes the whole book of Lamentations. If you walk away with anything from the book of Lamentations, walk away with this. If you sin, there will be repercussions. If you sin, God will punish you. Everything that you see in the book of Lamentations take place and that which is recorded is actually what God had already promised in His covenant to the nation of Israel that He was going to do to them coming, just coming to fruition. That's all that it is. God promised that that's what He was going to do. That was the promise that was given to God's people. You know, really the same principle still applies. Now we're not under the old law covenant, but here's the thing. We are the children of God. We are the people of God. We make up the nation of God. In the New Testament, that's who we are. Christians, born-again believers, are the people of God. 
And if you decide just to live a sinful life, if you say, hey, you know, I'm going to stop going to church. I'm going to stop going soul winning. I'm done reading my Bible. You know, I'm bored with praying. I have no use, you know, of serving God. You just decide just to go out and do what you want and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's not going to go. It's not, it's not just going to, you know, happen the way that you think it is. It's not, you're not going to go unpunished. You're not going to just be able to get away with it as you think you will. You know what will happen? The crown will be taken from your head. The bless God, you'll realize that God was blessing you a lot more than you thought, number one. But number two, in a very literal sense, the crown will be taken from your head. And what I'm referring to is rewards in heaven. The Bible is very, very clear that our actions on this earth reflect the way in which we are going to be rewarded when we get to heaven. Now, we oftentimes just focus on and, and, and we kind of just centralize the, the, the conversation on the blessings and cursings in this life. But there is much, much more than that. There is a lot more than that because you have eternity to look forward to. And what really would even make sense to, to focus on even more so is how we are going to be rewarded when we get to heaven. Because this life is only just for a moment. It only lasts for a period of time. It, you know, you can actually count it. It's, it, it's, it's finite. But when you die and you take your last breath, you know, if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven and be there forever. You're going to go to heaven and be there for all of eternity. There will be no end. And the things that you do in this life and the life that you live and your, reaction, your actions in this life are going to decide how you are rewarded. And there are crowns. There are seven crowns in the New Testament that are spoken of. Seven crowns. And there are particular traits. There are particular traits and characteristics that can reward you those crowns. And can enable you to receive those crowns. There are men that are recorded that receive crowns. You have the elders, the 24 elders in heaven. These are literal men that are standing in the presence of God that God has awarded them with crowns. And obviously they met a certain standard. Obviously, you know, these men were, they, they met a certain qualification or a certain requirement in order to receive those crowns. You know, I don't know which crown particularly they had. You know, it talks about the crown of life and so forth. But there are different things that you can do. You know, to earn these crowns. And you know one thing that can get your crown taken away? Do you know one thing that can cause the crown to fall from your head? Is living in sin. Look at Israel. Look at the nation of Israel. Look at the nation of Judah. And look at Jerusalem. And see what happened. God awarded them with a crown. They were God's people. And because when they lived in righteousness, God gave them rewards. God blessed them. God gave them, you know, glory and honor and gold and abundance and all sorts of things. Because of their righteousness and because they were walking in the law of the Lord and walking in God's word. But you know what? When they started sinning, what happened? Obviously, you know, individuals didn't lose their salvation, but God punished them on this earth. You know what else he did? He took away their crown. He took away the, uh, the crown and the rewards and the glory and the honor that he had given to them. You know, you need, not only should we think about God's punishment to us and his chastising of us while we're on this earth because we are saved... We should also think more about heaven and our eternal awards or rewards that God will award us with. We need to think about how what we do now, how it's going to affect our eternity. And when we stand before God, you know, how many crowns you're going to get. There's, there's seven crowns that are mentioned in the New Testament. Or whether or not you'll get any. And you know a good way to have the crown fall from your head is to live in sin. And I preached that sermon and actually in... We read the verse in Nehemiah chapter number 13 where he talks about don't wipe away the good, the good deeds that I've done. Wipe not away the good deeds that I've done. He says, remember me, right? You know, we want to we look to ourselves like it says in the New Testament. Look to ourselves, he says, that ye lose not those things which ye have wrought. Right now you may have a spiritual crown, you know, uh, 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 just you know, kind of uh, in, anticipatory sitting on your head right now. God's just anticipating to give you a crown. You know what could cause you to lose that crown or could cause you to lose that glory and honor that he would award you with? And that you would have kneeled before him and he would have crowned you or however that works. You know what could cause you? Sin. Sin could cause you to, 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 to lose the rewards you would have got. God may revoke awards that he, or rewards that he would have given to you. He may take those away. Why? Because of sin. It says, the crown is fallen from our head. And he says, woe unto us. It's like a curse, something bad. 
Woe unto us that we have sinned. He means like because we have sinned. Look at verse 17. For this our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim. Because of the mountain of Zion which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old, but thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. I want you to notice how it just ends very depressing in an extremely disappointing way. And as I you know, gave kind of my summary or just you know, title to this chapter in a very hopeless way. Uh, the way I would conclude this chapter, I want to give you one last thought about Lamentations chapter number 5, and then we're going to conclude the Bible study going through the book of Lamentations, is this. <clears throat> he says this. He's describing Zion. And it says in verse 18, Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. Now, where is he describing there? That is physical Zion, isn't it? So he's describing physical Zion. He's describing Jerusalem, you know, if you will, which now is. Jerusalem which is upon this earth. And I want you to notice that it didn't last forever. It wasn't always glorious. They didn't always have power. There wasn't just a kingdom that was located there that will last for eternity, was there? No. Now, there was, there, there was Zion or Jerusalem which now is. But that is many times, you know, spoken of uh, uh, or, or in heaven as also being referred to as Zion. You know, heavenly Jerusalem it's referred to as. It says, which is above. That is also called Zion. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that it says this. So there in verse 17, for this, for this our heart is faint, for these things our eyes, our, our eyes are dim. Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. Then he says in verse 19, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, <clears throat> thy throne from generation to generation. Now, well, well, let me ask you this. Where is God located? Where is His throne located? In heavenly Jerusalem. It's located in the Mount Zion, which is above. You know, when we're singing the song, we're marching to Zion, where are we singing about? Are we singing about that we're all marching, you know, uh, over to the nation of Israel, the Holy Land? Of course not. We're singing about marching to heavenly Jerusalem. We're singing about marching to the heavenly Zion, which is where? Which is above. Now, I don't think that it's a coincidence that this chapter ends this way and this book ends this way, that it contrasts here at the end in a very dark, dreary way, seemingly with no hope. It ends with there being no hope found in physical Jerusalem, no hope found on this earth in the physical nation of Israel, but then it contrasts that with the spiritual world. Contrast that with a spiritual aspect of heaven, of heavenly Zion. You know what it says? It says, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. <clears throat> this earth is not going to last forever. The Bible tells us that it's going to be folded up. The Bible says that it's going to be burned up. You know, but heaven, on the other hand, lasts forever. God's throne will always exist. God's throne will never be moved. And heavenly Jerusalem will always be there and will always exist. You know, sometimes, especially the, you know, the Zionist, if you will, you know, they'll, they'll, they put so much stock in you know, the Holy Land here. You know, Jerusalem on this earth. But even Christians that may be us that understand the, the, the dangers of Zionism and that there is nothing special about the, you know, the physical location over there in the Middle East of which we call Israel. Even us, sometimes, you know what we do is we fall in love with this world. Or we fall in love with our possessions or our inheritance which we have in this world. And you know what happened to those that were living in Jerusalem at the time that Babylon came in and just wrecked their life is they realized that the things of this earth don't last that long. The things of this earth don't last forever. You know, this world is, you're not going to be here forever. You're only going to spend a very, you know, a very small amount of time. You can't even compare the amount of time that you're going to spend on this earth to that which we, you are going to spend in heaven. 
I'm sure there were many people that were living, you know, lavish lives, very luxurious lives. And then all of a sudden, doors are busted down. Their world is flipped upside down. They're a servant, as it says. They're a widow, possibly. They're having to labor to go collect water. They're having, having to labor to go collect wood. They've now become enslaved and they are a captive. When previous to this, they were living you know, a, a, a very lavish life. You know what happened was, they, I'm sure they realized that the things of this world were not promised to, you know, tomorrow. And the th same thing could happen to the United States of America. The same thing could happen to our lives. The exact same thing could happen tomorrow. And you know, the stock market is a very good example of that. Because a lot of people that basically hoisted their finances and hoisted their lives to the stock market have many times invested all of their money into that and then it just completely crashes. That's happened a couple of times. It completely crashes and you know what they're left with? Nothing. You know what they realize? Like, hey, I really can't put my stock, no pun intended, in the things of this life or in the things of this world. You can't, you know, you can't depend on the things in this world. You know why? Because it's all temporary. It all tends towards disorder. But you know what you can put stock in? Heavenly Jerusalem. You know what you can look forward to? The rewards that are in heaven. Look at Jerusalem. They had a crown on their head, but it didn't last forever. God honored and gave glory unto physical Jerusalem, but guess what? It didn't last forever. And I think we see a great contrast there with those that trusted in the Old Covenant, those that trusted in the things of this earth, you know, the earthly nation of God, the earthly kingdom of God, contrasted with heavenly, the heavenly kingdom, the heavenly nation of God, the earthly Israel, that hey, yeah, there were people in there that were of spiritual Israel, but we're just talking about just in general, those that were physical Israel. That wasn't enough for them. And if they just put their trust in that kingdom, it only lasted while they were here. Only for a short time. But you know what really matters is the throne that's in heaven. You know what really matters is the heavenly kingdom. You know, Zion which is above. And that's why he contrasts it to him. He says, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever. That's something that's going to remain forever. Yeah. Your inheritance in heaven, your inheritance here can be taken away. But you know what can't be taken away? Your inheritance in heaven. Your seed in heaven or your mansion in heaven, that can't be taken from you or robbed from you. And then he says, thy throne from generation to generation. Notice how he contrasts, again, the crown. That's what's being you know, paralleled here. The crown is being contrasted from you know, falling from the head of Jerusalem on this earth to God's honor, God's glory, God's throne. But that lasts forever. It's something that's not going to be taken from him. And then it ends in a very dark way uh, to those that would trust in the Old Covenant, if you will, in that uh, analogy or in a figure there. Turn thou, un turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. And then he says, but thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. I believe that this is a, a precursor, if you will, a pre, uh, 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 just a picture, right, of the ultimate and full rejection of the nation of Israel as a whole. And then also what we see throughout the book of Lamentations is we see a, it's also a, a, a forerunner or just a, an Old Testament picture of Babylon being destroyed. You know, we see Babylon being destroyed in the New Testament, which, you know, I'm not going to go into this right now, which is Jerusalem. And the same exact things that are recorded in the book of Lamentations, uh, you know, would be a description of, we're basically being able to look into the future and see what would take place and what it would be like for Jerusalem uh, to be flatlined or for Babylon to be flatlined. So that is the end of the book of Lamentations. It's, you know, basically, if you want to summarize it, the title is perfect. Not all the other books are like that. Many of the other books aren't like that. But the book of Lamentations, it's just that. It's a book of lamenting. And the lamenting is because of sin. The lamenting is because of the sinfulness <clears throat> and the breaking of God's covenant, the breaking of God's commandment uh, that, of course, the nation of Israel was guilty of. And what we as Christians, what New Testament Christians, what we can learn from that is that if we follow the same path that they did, the same thing's going to happen. You know, we're, God is not mocked. You know, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, if we sow, you know, seeds of sin, we are going to reap the same. We're going to reap the punishments and we're going to have to bear our own iniquity. So let's learn from the Old Testament people of God 
And as the New Testament people of God, let's, to the best of our ability, let's walk in the light so that we don't have to go through the atrocities and the pains and the sorrows of sin because you will not go unpunished. Let's bow our heads, bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the book of Lamentations, even though it's a very negative book, dear God. We ask you that many people were able to learn from it, dear Lord. Ask us to, uh, uh, that we would continue to study your word, that you would open our eyes and help us to continually grow uh, in the book of Lamentations and in the rest of the Bible. We love you so much and just uh, please, dear Lord, just uh, uh, instill zeal in our hearts and a, a, a burning love for your word uh, so that we would continue to study it, continue to love it, and preach it and teach it to other people. People. Just be with us and bless all the families that are here. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. <laughs>